So welcome back to our shop. Today we have a mixed topic. We have brass, we have some neodymium magnets and we have some mild steel. And what, you, what we are going to do is, um, at work we have magnets that are laminated out of ferrite magnets and brass. And they are surface ground all over flat, parallel and square and they are super useful. You can use them to hold small parts on the surface ground over the, um, the pole pitch of the magnet chuck is two cores. Or you can use them as a stop on the vise, on the side of the vise. As they are surface ground, they will perfectly line up with the side of the vise. Um, there are hundreds of uses for them. Aligning parts for, um, for assembly and so on and so on. They are quite expensive. You can buy them from most uh, tooling suppliers for about 300 bucks a pop and they're 25 millimeters square in cross section and 100 millimeters long. So I'm not willing to pay that um, because the materials are almost dirt cheap. You can get ugh, a handful of these <coughs> uh, rather strong um, neodymium magnets for a few bucks on eBay. The problem with these is they are quite brittle. It, it's almost impossible to machine them with a with an end mill or on a lathe, and when you surface grind them, they make. <laughs> uh, first of all, you get a, a pretty impressive spark shower because uh, the material of these tends to be quite inflammable um, when it's uh, in, in dust form or grinding dust form. Um, also, when you run an end mill into them, they <laughs> uh, you're up for a surprise. And the other problem is they are coated with, um, they are nickel plated and when you damage the nickel plating they corrode and um, oxidize with the um, oxygen in the air and they will degrade over time. So best thing to do is not to touch them in any way. This one is already chipped from me playing around with them and let, let them snap together. That that tells you about something about the brittleness of these guys. So I came up with another idea. Um, first of all, when we take such a magnet and when we look at the field lines, um, they are polarized. So the top side is uh, north and the other side is south or vice versa. don't know which one is which. Let's look at my good cat drawing here. Um, basically, if we have the magnets just sitting here, the field lines go out like this. Just out of the faces. But if we place a, a mild steel plate on the end of the magnet, uh, on both sides of this magnet, the field lines don't go out the side anymore. Show you with this see almost no stictivity but on the faces here we got very very high forces even more on this side because the surface area is bigger almost hard to get up get it off um, and on this side we can barely lift the part Opposed to the naked magnet, which is in this orientation almost very hard to get up uh, without having to pry it off. So what we will do is we will make a plate out of brass with two holes in it. There will be two magnets in it and it will be covered on both sides with a piece of mild steel which acts as a pole plate to, to direct the field lines out of the side of the magnet. So we get full holding strength on the on the other faces of the of this uh, stack up but no magnet field lines or magnet force on this side. That way we get a very even very powerful magnet. At least I hope. Um, we will machine these brass plates, these um, uh, mild steel plates from uh, cold drawn steel. Um, 
You want a very low carbon steel for this purpose so you don't get a lot of residual magnetism. Um, soft iron or um, uh, transformer sheet metal, it's, it's, um, it's basically raw iron with nothing in it, uh, would be perfect, but it's hard to get, so um, cold ground steel will have to do it. And then we'll do the stack up and we will glue it all together and surface machine and surface grind it all over which is not a problem because there is no exposed magnet to the outside we only have the brass plates between and the brass plates with the magnets in them and the uh, mild steel pole plates between them but right now as i think of it i think we are going to uh, with one magnet not with two because there won't be much meat left to the side to square up this block uh, which you have to do after uh, after some time because these the, everything on these magnets is soft and they will get dinged up and yeah, they will be yeah we we are surfacing them at work pretty much every year to get them back in spec so Let's start with these chunks of very rough brass. Uh, this is all bandsaw cut on all surfaces. Um, square them up and see if we can get enough material out. Um, I'm aiming for a length of about 60 millimeters and that means we have to do uh, seven, seven of the brass plates and eight of the sheet metal plates. Eight because we want a plate on both sides, of course. So oh, let's go. And we're going with one magnet. Just decided that. Okay, now we're over at the milling machine with the rough piece of brass clamped up in the vise. And I'm using a fly cutter to clean up the surface, which worked very well. The problem with the fly cutter is the chips fly all over in the shop. And on the next setup, I decided to use an end mill. Here you can see the finish from the fly cutter. We put this machine surface against the fixed jaw of the vise. And to square up the part, I'm using a ball bearing ball that has a flat ground onto it. That's between the movable jaw and the piece of brass. The flat on the ball bearing is so you don't put a dent into your vise jaw. And as you can see by the surface finish, this end mill is pretty much done. So I changed to a 10mm 6 flute carbide end mill, which did a way better job. Then I flipped the part around, put it down on parallels, nice and tight, and machined the other side parallel to the first side. And that's pretty much my standard procedure to square up material that has no square surface at all. Uh, the ball bearing makes it very easy to get things square. As the material was pretty thick and I didn't want to machine away all the brass, which is quite expensive material, um, I decided to use a slitting saw and slice the piece up in, in thickness. So. Here I'm running the 63mm slitting saw, 1mm thick, through the material, but the cutting depth was not quite enough, so I have to go on both sides to cut it apart completely. On the first side this went quite well, and also on the back side I didn't have big problems until the end where the blade deviated about half a millimeter. And I blame this to the saw blade itself because it was not brand new and I used it on steel before quite a lot. The mill is perfectly in trim but um, when the saw blade is not cutting very well you get problems like this. And I changed back to the six fluid carbide end mill and cleaned up the surface and machined it also to thickness. Normally I wouldn't use a six fluid 
coated end mill on brass, but this was the only big end mill that I had on hand. Okay, I got the two bars squared up and the thickness, not super precise, but they are within dimensions. And now, I, now we need to cut them to length, but before I do that, I face off the end on both sides and I will cut off a slice, reface the remaining stock. I do that so I have always a reference surface on my stock before I cut it off. And as this is a multiple setup, I have my two parallels and I will drop in a spring between the parallels. So parallels don't fall out or get sucked into the cutter, which would suck because this is a quite expensive new six fluter. I would normally use this only on steel and finishing cuts, but in this case it's the only bigger brand new end mill that I have. And I'm not, absolutely not fussing about the finish in this case, I just want to clean it up as much as possible. Now we cut off four pieces, uh, one on each end and clean it up, clean the remaining stock up and cut the remaining parts. Just just use the adding to blue up the surface slightly so we see our layout line. There are two ways you can lay out with a, with a caliper. You can use it like this, like a scribe, but this ruins the measuring uh, legs here. Um, what I wanted to do for the longest time, I wanted to take a caliper shorten one one of the legs machine out a, a small notch and braze in a piece of carbide so it's a dedicated uh, scribing caliper and the other way is you you can use this edge and this edge for for a layout like this just use a scriber and hit the part like that. And it would help if you did the bluing wide enough. And yeah, this ruins the caliper too, and you shouldn't do this at all. But this is my not so good, or it is a mitutuyu, but. It's not as that accurate as it should be anymore. It's, it has seen its fair share of use and abuse. I bought the second hand and it's, it's one of the nicer ones. It has the, the prismatic wee ways and it's parallax free. There is no gap here or step. So you can look on it in every direction. You don't get the parallax error like you would on a normal caliper. Uh, these are horrible expensive, but as said, this has seen better days and I use it only for minor work. My main calipers, of course, the Digimatic, the Gematic, uh, Digital Mitoyo. So now we can cut this down. I think I will do it with a hacksaw. Um, brass always calls for a brand new blade that has not seen much use, otherwise it will just skate across the material. Um, brass is bearing material, not a very good one, but it is a bearing material and it, um, if, if the saw blade or your cutter is dull in any way, you will slide over the material. Um, here we are preparing the steel pole plates, which uh, are already milled on one side and cut to length. And, and I'm just squaring up the second side. Pressing it down on the parallels, clamping it. 
running the mill with power feed and in the meantime I'm deburring the second part or the part that I mach uh, machined before. Compressed air makes it easy to keep the setup clean so you don't get chips under your part. Okay, you saw me just machining down the cold world steel to be also square and uh, parallel. And this is how the stack up will look like. Uh, steel brass, steel brass, and so on and so on, and we will end with a steel piece again. Uh, right now, what we have here is a magnetic parallel that we could use on the surface grinder if we connected it all through and made it one solid block. So, <laughs> uh, uh, we will make a we will make a set of parallel blocks, uh, magnetic parallels for the surface grinder in another video. Um, I like the laminated version more than the pinned version, uh, more common here. Um, but this will get a precision ground magnet. So we'll take these brass blocks and drill them in the center, uh, 8 millimeter diameter, so we can glue in these near denning magnets. And then we will end up with an hopefully awful strong magnet that we can grind on all surfaces. So let's drill these brass plates. But brass has of course the property to be very brittle and it tends to grab the drill once you uh, poke through the other side of the material. Then the, the drill bit will screw down into the material just like this. Rip out the part out of the vise and uh, yeah, you know the story, sitting in a corner crying. Um, there is an easy fix to that. You want to make your drill bit a... Normally it has a positive rake. A rake indicated by the spiral angle. And you want it to be zero degrees. So you take a, a small triangular stone and you lay it flat into across the main cutting edge here. Tip it. You will find the alignment, the right alignment and give it a few wipes with the stone. And both cutting edges, of course. And this very small flat spot is enough to keep the drill from grabbing. Here we are drilling with the modified 8mm drill bit and as you can see there is no pre-drilling, no center drilling. I have to drill pretty short and I call it and I can drill right through without any major problems. If you would use a drill bit that's ha that has not been modified on the cutting edges this could lead to troubles. You will catch your work and the work will get ripped out of the wise. Okay, I get the stack up, uh, put together on my on my small lapping plate, just as it's a flat surface, and I have the magnet just push into the, the brass plates. It's loose in there, and I have the steel pole plates on both sides, and I stack them up completely against each other, and uh, seems to work. Seems to work pretty well. Um, this, this piece has about, I have no idea, one or two kilograms. <laughs> I'm horrible at guessing weights. Um, but as you can see, oh, this, is, this is a pretty strong uh, magnet stack up here. And it has no magnetism, or pretty much no magnetism at all on the ends, only on, the, on these surfaces which we are interested in. So, next step will be to clean everything, mix up some quickset epoxy, glue it all together. And you have to keep in mind uh, the, the magnetic force of this will increase when we surface grind it because um, the quality of a surface um, affects the, um, 
the the sticktivity of the magnet to another surface uh, in great uh, in a great matter. Let's see. We have um, this is some we have some JB Weld down here which we won't use. We will use this stuff. This is uh, uh, basically a five minute epoxy without any filler. Um, there is one thing with the stack up. I'm not sure if it, if the glue only the glue alone will hold this together. I'm tempted when we glued it up that I am going to drill through uh, in the corners through the whole stack up and rivet it together with uh, long brass pins. Maybe we'll do that, but maybe it's not necessary. Let's see. Let's do the glue up. Okay, I wrapped my my small lapping plate in sarin film so I don't get the epoxy stuck to it. Now we will mix up a small batch of the five minute epoxy and try to assemble this guy without making a horrible mess on my workbench. That's pretty much this stuff is not very critical with um, with the mixing ratio. Uh, there we go, that should do. Uh, now we will start out with a piece of steel, a piece of brass. And I marked the polarity of the magnets on here with some with an adding. And uh, I already went through the procedure how to do this. I'm, I'm giving a small dab of epoxy onto the magnet, then I shove it in. And we drilled them pretty close, I realize. Um, we might have to use a little help. But before we do that, I will mark the polarity on the brass too, like this. Now we take a small... There we go. Uh, piece of paper, wipe off the excess. Which wouldn't be necessary because we were <laughs> um, applying more anyway. Now we take our first steel plate, or a pole plate, spread some epoxy on it, and dink, there we go. Try to align it, take our second uh, pole plate, or steel plate, which makes it sound much more massive. Not to get a piece of glove stick sticked in there. So and now the next magnet has to be in the opposite orientation, otherwise you lose um, holding strength. At least that's what I found due to experimentation. So we take our next magnet, place it in a bread piece of brass. Uh, no. Check the polarity, mark it. This should all go a bit faster because the epoxy is setting, <laughs> setting up. Um, and now we have to oppose it that way. Just a small double dia of epoxy. And put them together. Okay, the epoxy has set and it's all holding together and we have a lot of squeeze out of course, but uh, sh we should be able to machine this down to be roughly squared up. Then we will drill through in two corners and uh, put in two pins to give it a, some additional strength. 